Let's turn over to uh, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, chapter number five. That's Revelation, chapter number five, please. I would like to speak to you this morning about the marks of Christ. This goes along with the messages I've been doing the last four or five weeks, however long it's been, concerning the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And uh, the cross, in other words, and, and what it means to us and to him. All right. So we'll talk about the marks of Christ today. Now, as we look at this, let's notice verse number one. All right. And then I'll read verse number six. So verse one says of chapter five, book of Revelation, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. Who is the him here? Any, who is the him? How can you read this without knowing who him is? How about, how about the Lord Jesus Christ? All right. So let's come down to verse number six. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And I saw a lamb. Now, who's the lamb? That's the lamb. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's do this. Come back to 1 Corinthians 15, please. 1 Corinthians 15. And let's see what we can find this morning concerning the marks of Christ. Now, by way of introduction, they saw a lamb. John saw a lamb. And who does the lamb represent? Jesus Christ. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. When you go to chapter 22, the Lamb and the Father are on the throne. They are the light. All right? And so we see that's another name for our Lord Jesus Christ. But what do we think of when we think of a Lamb in relationship to Jesus Christ? His sacrifice he made, the cross work, in, in other words. Okay? That's what we see there. Now, when we come over to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, let's notice here a few verses, beginning in verse 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So we have before us here two patterns. The first man is a pattern of what? A living soul. The second man, Adam, who is our Lord Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Now notice, became a life-giving spirit. Our Lord came, and the Word became flesh and did what? Dwell among us. So he dwelled among us as a man. But he became a life-giving spirit. All right? Then it says this, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Then the spiritual. I think we have to understand that. First is natural, then is spiritual. As Dan alluded to in Sunday school, I think we have to keep this in mind. When the natural goes to the ground, dust to dust, that's where we return. The individual is raised, not the dust. What's he raised to? A spiritual body that you find in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, among other places, okay? But watch what happens here as we look at this. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from earth, earthy. The second man is from where? Heaven. The Lord came down from heaven, did he not? Okay. In the beginning, the Word was with God. The Word was God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Man, that is great. I mean, how, can you be, how can't you smile about that? As is the what? Heavenly, so are they that are what? Man, that's us, folks. Dan was talking about, well, we really don't know what's going on in heaven. I'll tell you what's happening in heaven. The same thing that's happening on earth, minus the evil. Because the heart of man is now sanctified and purified in the heavens. 
Do you really think you're going up there with a harp and a, <laughs> a crown? It goes float around. No, you're going to be laboring, ruling and reigning as you are ruling and reigning where? Are you doing it here? Sure you are. At least ruling and reigning yourself. Okay, but let's keep going. That, that's not the subject here as we look at it. Verse 49. So just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of what? The heavenly. What is the heavenly as you, as you look up here? Okay. Uh, Adam became a life giving what? Spirit. Now, I'm gonna, this is a question I'm going to ask you, and I won't have you raise your hand like we did uh, at the introduction here. Is this automatic? Did this happen automatically? Well, I'm going to say no, it did not. Come, come back to Hebrews with me, please. And chapter two, we'll start there. I have four verses in Hebrews I'd like to share with you, and then, then we'll get into the uh, marks of Christ. This is just foundational thoughts here. When we get to chapter 2, notice with me verse number 10, first of all, in the book of Hebrews. For it, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation. How? Somebody say it loudly so the people can hear. Through suffering. Through suffering. That's how it happens, through sufferings. Turn over to verse number 18, please. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to aid to those who are what? Tempted. All right. Now, that's an interesting verse in, in itself, which he has suffered. He was tempted as you and I are. Come to chapter 5, please. All right, chapter number five. Notice with me, please, verse number eight. Although he was a son, and notice capital S in your Bible, isn't it? He learned obedience from the things which he did what? Isn't that amazing? Here's the Lord Jesus Christ that came down out of heaven. The word was made flesh. Yet he learned obedience through what? Through suffering. Do you believe that? The perfect sinless man learned obedience through suffering. Finally, come over to chapter 13. All right. Chapter number 13, please. We're still in Hebrews. And let's notice verse number 12. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So what do we know about Jesus in his desire to bring all men to salvation? How did it happen? Through his sufferings. And we always point, you know, we point to the cross, rightly so, and the cross work. And we've been talking all these weeks, but that is the center. The cross is what manifests to man the very love of God. It really does, although most of mankind has no conception of that, all right? But that's it, the love of God. So as we look at this, see about the suffering. Did he just suffer on the cross? Did he suffer any other time? Well, let's look at this this morning, see what we can find. Come to Matthew, first of all. So here, Joey put up the... I make this as simple as possible because Susan says I use too many verses and people try to write them down and keep them. So we put it in an outline form here. So uh, an examination of the marks of Jesus, A, his birth was under a shadow of dishonor and shame. So let's go to Matthew here, say a few words about this uh, as we come over to chapter number one, please. All right. Chapter number one, verses 18 and 19 say this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When he, when his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. What does betrothed mean here? Anybody know? Okay, we, we usually say engaged, but if you do your homework on this, Promise to engage. What you're going to find that in the Jewish social life, this betrothing lasted for a whole year. And it was more than just an engagement. And we're going to see that in the next 
verse here, okay? It was something very serious. And when people saw these, the couple, Mary and Joseph, for example, they saw people that were married, even though they weren't married yet. Okay, betrothed. Now notice what it says in 19. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her. Well, why would he want to disgrace her? Because she was a child. And he was what? They were betrothed together, not just engaged. This wasn't a matter of saying, Mary, I want the ring back. I won't be around anymore. Okay? Wasn't that at all. R read what it says here now. Okay? And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away how? Secretly. In other words, he had to divorce her. And she had to be removed. He wanted her removed secretly so that they wouldn't stone her like the woman in John chapter number eight. Okay. That's what this was all about. And I say, well, Jesus isn't even born yet. And this is taking, this is taking place. Well, watch this. Come to John with me, please. In chapter eight, John chapter eight. So when I come over to John chapter eight and let's notice verse number uh, <laughs> 41. <clears throat> Okay, 41, where it says, you are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Now, how later is this? His mother was the spirit of God came upon her. Joseph was going to put her away secretly, divorce her secretly. But as you read down there, Matthew 1, we know the angel appeared to him and gave him the scoop on what happened. And, and so he accepted her, right? Accepted the child. But 30 years later, these people in Nazarene says, say what? We were not born of fornication. Well, how would they remember what happened 30 years ago? Can you think about that for a while? There were some awful bitter people in Nazareth. Now, here's the strange thing. Where did Joseph take Mary so that Jesus might be born? To Bethlehem, which is just a short 10 miles or so south of Jerusalem. And we know the story uh, about that, don't we? Okay. Now, while when, when Jesus was born, of course, you know, the shepherds came and all that. And uh, eight days later, he was circumcised. Then at a certain time, I don't know what the time frame is, Mary and uh, uh, Joseph went up to the tabernacle so she could be purified according to the law. And Jesus was just a young infant then. All right. But then what happens? Some wise men came through town and they told Herod about what has happened and we want to go see him. Okay, you all remember that? Well, what did Herod declare? Come on, about killing all the kids who were two years and under? Do you all remember that? So it's not, you know, I'm not sure exactly when those wise men came. In fact, when it came, he was a child, so probably older than one, one and a half years old. I believe that, that Mary and Joseph did not go back to Nazareth after the birth of Jesus. He was a carpenter. He can work anywhere. And that's where his family originally was from. He's family of David, right? So he stays there. But then what happens? This declaration comes from Herod because of the wise men who came to see Jesus. And they left a different way, by the way. Okay. And so the angel tells Joseph, get your family together and go where? Go to Egypt until Herod dies. All right. And that's recorded for us. But here's, here's a question for you. Okay. So we're talking about, uh, as you look at this, 
Okay. And actually that's what's my next point. So let's just go to the next point. His childhood was overshadowed by sorrow. Notice uh, chapter two of Matthew. Okay. I want to get ahead of myself instead of following the outline here. So I don't want to confuse you. So in chapter two, notice verses of Matthew 13, 14 and 15. Now, when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Uh, my, in my Bible, the word child is even capitalized because it's a reference to Jesus, right? And flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and they left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt I called what? My son. Now, then we read about Herod. All right. And which I'm not going to read, read the verses here, although I guess I could. Verses 16 to 18. Watch what it says. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and he sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. <sighs> Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet was fulfilled. A voice from a voice was heard in Rama weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. And she uh, refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up. Take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel for those who sought the child's life are what? Who are those who sought the child's life? Herod, but there, some Bibles say they. Those who sought the child's life. Now watch this. Just a little thing of history for you. Recorded by Josephus. Herod had a number of sons. By the way, he killed them all. But he had one left. I mean, he was just a great dad. And uh, the one son who was to take his place as king was with his advisors. And the old man, Herod, is never going to die. And I'm going to be an old man myself when I become king. Well, his father got wind of that. Sent the boys out, executed his son, who was his son. He's one of the those, Herod and Herod. They were both killed. Okay, one died. By the way, Herod died, Herod the Great. That's who gave the uh, command to go out and kill the kids, the children. Um, he died in 4 AD. Okay, so his son died four days before he did. Pretty quick, right? Now, when was Jesus born? What's our best guess? 4 BC. That's what most people, that Mr. Bullinger, and he follows, as he says in, in his, uh, you know, uh, appendices, all right? That's what men think, okay? So, four, you know, we, we measure time AD from zero, right? And they say that's the birth of Christ. It was actually 4 BC. So, how old was Jesus when he got to return to Nazareth? He was eight years old. He wasn't a little baby. He was eight years old. So where did he spend the first eight years of his life? Actually, you know, minus maybe a year that he was in uh, he's, he's Egypt. And what's the Bible to say Egypt is? The what? The world. It's the world. What else? When, when Israel was delivered from Egypt, the furnace, the furnace of Egypt, that's where he was. What is a furnace? <laughs> Rose says a, a place where you learn a lot. It has to do with purification and that sort of thing. Lessons to be learned. And so our Lord was raised the first eight years in Egypt. Okay, that's found, by the way, in Deuteronomy 4.20. Okay, so we see that in our Lord's life then. Okay, that, that he was raised there. But this thing about his mother becoming pregnant before the actual wedding it hung for 30 years. 
and they use it against our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I was trying to think of an illustration. I did not watch the Academy Awards. I, I never watched Academy Awards. But you all heard about it, right? Yeah. Because of the slap. So who is Will Smith protecting? His wife. I wonder if the Lord himself felt like slapping these people. <laughs> There in John, when he said, we be not born of fornication, it wasn't against Jesus. It was against who? Whom? Against his mother. All right. Now, these are things that he lived with in his mind. All right. Now, now watch this. Uh, <laughs> I have here his, his early uh, manhood was spent in toil and labor. Come back to chapter 13 of Matthew, please. All right. Matthew 13. Now notice this, toil and labor, and not all his labor was manual labor, if, if you please. So in chapter 13, let me get the right verse here, 55 to 58, which we don't have. Oh, here it is, 13. 12 doesn't have 55 to 58. Here we go. All right, in verse 55, it says this, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and his, his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Where was he when he said this? He was in Nazareth, his hometown. So how were they treating him? He was without honor in his hometown and, his, and in his own what? Household. Come over with me, if you would, uh, to John 7. In his own household, he was without honor. Hard to understand. Notice John chapter 7, verses 1 to 7. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, so that your, your disciples may see your works, which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. Did our Lord seek to be known publicly? No. Okay. If you do these things, show yourself to the world for not, for not even his brothers were believing in him, not even his brothers. And that's what we just read in chapter 13 of Matthew, his brothers, his family didn't believe him. All right. And it's a sad situation. When you see that he, what are you saying, brother Dan? He had to live with that. That whole concept, he was unliked, if you please, within the family structure. I'm, not, I'm sure not by his mother, but by, by at least by his brothers, it says. Okay, that's what, he, that's what he had to live with, as you see that. Now, come back to Matthew 8, please, and let's see how he was. <laughs> I have poverty and humiliation. We read about the Lord being hungry, but he, he could do what he needed to do to eat, right? Turn the, the bread to much bread and the fish to much fish. But no, notice what it says here in chapter number 8 and verse number 20, where it says, Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What is that in relationship to? That's to his traveling to carry his, his ministry throughout Galilee, mainly. Okay? But he had yet not the place not to lay his head. In other words, he wasn't invited in anywhere. Okay? He wasn't the most popular guy unless he was feeding people or healing people. Okay? We have another verse that we can uh, uh, look at there in chapter 27 of Matthew. All right? Matthew 27, 
In verse number 60, this is a very familiar verse. Uh, verse 59, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it, the body of our Lord, in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. So was Jesus laid in his own tomb? No, it was a borrowed tomb. OK, a borrowed tomb that he ended up in. It's a sad situation. You talk about humility. That, that's what it is. And I was thinking of tombs. Just hang in here with me for a minute. Uh, remember in chapter 11 of Genesis, we had the Tower of Babel. What was the Tower of Babel? What was it to be? Well, it says they want to be, it was to be a monument for mankind. They knew they weren't going to reach the heavens. They can only go so far and quit breathing way up in that air, right? As, as the Oranius, as we've been studying on Wednesday nights with the word air. And it was a monument. Then I got to thinking, because we have a cemetery, you know, a quarter mile down the road from us. And we used to walk the dog there, <laughs> that kind of things. All right. You go to that cemetery. What do you see in a cemetery? What's that? Gravestone. Well, tombstones, gravestones. And, you know, most of them are yay high or whatever. But every once in a while, what do you see? You see a big one. All right. Somebody that wants somebody to remember them and who they are. You know, a monument. When I die, I want a monument to me. That's what they're saying. All right. You know, when we were at Trinity Baptist, uh, where I went to school, uh, they had a huge complex there, land wise. OK. And buildings. They had, they had the school there and, the, and then the, uh, you know, the church ministry was there. But they uh, someone mentioned, hey, we have all this land. Why don't we have our own cemetery? Actually, it's the graveyard. Does anybody know the difference between a cemetery and a graveyard? Gail, she knows. A graveyard is attached to a church. A cemetery is separate. Okay. So we want a graveyard, but someone else said, yeah, but we don't want big monuments made to people. And so they determined, yes, we'll do this. And so they were allowed to put plaques, actually, or brass or metal plaques that, that fit into the ground, and they were flat. So from the road, you didn't even know it was there. You know, you didn't. Really, and I thought I always thought that was a good idea. That's humility, being humble, you know, not standing out among the crowd, in other words, you know, as, as we see that. But but enough of that. A borrowed tomb. So that brings us to this. OK. Humanly speaking. Now, watch. Humanly speaking. Let me say it a third time. So you understand. Humanly speaking, our Lord's ministry was a failure. Let me share with you my thoughts on this. Come to Isaiah, please, in chapter 53. Isaiah 53. And let's notice verse number three. He was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with Grief. Now, my Bible has in the, the margin, literally the word grief means sickness. He wasn't sick, but he was acquainted with it. Okay. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Just take that verse and put it right there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is how people perceived him. And the Isaiah was given this by the Spirit of God to write. Let, this is what this man's going to be. Has, surely our griefs 
in himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him what? Stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. And it goes on here in chapter 53, does it not? So what do we see? We see a sad picture here of, of our Lord's relationship, actually men's relationship with him, not his with theirs. Uh, so come on back with me then to John chapter number one, okay? Which makes it very clear as we look at this. John chapter one. <clears throat> Notice verse 11. He came to his own. All right? He came to his own. And those who were his own did not receive him. Who was his own? That would be Israel. Israel. All right? They didn't receive him. He came for a purpose. I've come to seek and save that which was lost. Primary goal was Israel. But what happened with it? It didn't happen, was it? That's why I say it was, it was a failure. Men didn't recognize him for who he really was. Now, we know he had 12 apostles. One was a, you know, a turncoat, a traitor. And then there was above 500 at once that he appeared to. So we're assuming, at least I assume, that in his ministry, there was at least 500 people that sincerely believed him or believed on him, okay, in his ministry. And I guess you would say that's, well, that's pretty good for a lifetime. Well, maybe so. All right. But in the view of men that we're talking about, not in God's view, because God knew ultimately what it would lead to and what would his cross work ultimately lead to, even though he was despised by men, it would be the salvation of all men, say salvation of all men. So who were who were the Lord's friends and companions? What kind of people? Gail says just ordinary. And they were ordinary working people, fishermen, tax collectors, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. That's who they were. Of course, we know that uh, 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 Joseph, who was a Pharisee, gave up his tomb for the Lord. Right. And we know that Nicodemus ended up going with the Lord. And the Bible does say that many of the, uh, the Pharisees ended up believing. So we praise the Lord. So we don't know exactly how many, how many, okay. But his friends here and his companions were of the common class. Now I wonder who his friends and companions were in the heavens before he came. Have you ever thought of that? Well, okay. We say the angels, the seraphim, all this, his father. I mean, it's hard for me even to imagine it. You know, he came forth out of his father's heart and, and, and you just you just think about it. I mean, I don't know if you think about those things, but I, but I do. OK, you think about those. And, and he came down to save man. And so uh, I have many ideas about resurrection nowadays. But I want you to think of this. You know, uh, Paul wrote that he took captivity captive. Who's captivity? Okay, well, there were, there were men, okay? I believe that's when Israel went up at his ascension in Acts chapter 2. Because when we get the, the, verse, the verses we've been looking at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 for the last three weeks, and we're going to continue one more week on that, did the Lord come by himself? Who did he come with? See, we all say angels, but it, doesn't, it, it says angels, but it says the saints. Somebody up there already came back with them to get those that were in the grave. All right. So all these things are exciting. But, but the idea here is this, because we're talking about the suffering or the marks of Christ. He was a common, his friends and companions were the common people of society. Okay. He left the glories of heaven to come and be friends with them. All right. To be friends with them. In G, I have the spirit of his life was ever chastened and humbled. Come back to Matthew chapter 12. Okay, Matthew chapter 12. 
There was a veil of modesty that covered all his acts and attitudes. He wasn't an I person, in other words. Chapter 12 here in Matthew, let's pick it up in verse 15, please. All right, first verse 15. Uh, 14 says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. So verse 15, but Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. Not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel. He will not what? What would Jesus quarrel about? Who would we quarrel with? The Pharisees tried to do it, didn't he? He will not quarrel, neither cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will what? They will hope. The who will hope? Now, who is this written by? Isaiah, right? And Isaiah is seeing in the future, not just Israel to be redeemed, but the Gentiles. And when you read Romans chapter number 15, you read about the ministry of Jesus Christ. There's three statements there. And in him, the Gentiles will rejoice in three different times. All right. Before Paul says, and I am the minister to the Gentiles in Romans chapter 15. So that's very important. But what is the point here? All right. The, the point as as you look at this, that he was, you know, his voice wouldn't be heard in town and those sort of things. He was humble in what he did and his relationship with other people. OK, he was a man who brought children to his lap when his disciples tried to get rid of the kids. Y'all remember that? All right. This is this is what he did. Uh, think about his entry into Jerusalem for a minute. Now, I'm asking you, you start beginning to use your imaginations. He comes, uh, well, what's today? Palm Sunday, all right, that the church does. Now, watch what happens here. So he's entering in. He comes in on a cult. Why a cult? Uh, the cult was a king that was coming in peace. If it was a king coming in war, he'd be on a big horse. See what I mean? All right. So that was the thing. And people were putting the palms down and all that kind of stuff and praising them and, and uh, uh, you know, hallelujah and all that sort of business. Well, I'm sure the Lord got off the colt and went and had a big dinner with everybody that was there. He didn't do that? What did he do? He went back to Bethany. Mary and Martha and Lazarus's house to spend the night. I mean, you know, I mean, they brought him forth. You know, there could have been great celebrations, but he didn't do that. N not at all. Okay. How about with the transfiguration? Now think of this. Okay, in the transfiguration, Matthew 17. Now that was a vision, right? It says so. To show no man, he says afterwards of Peter, James, and John. Tell no man of the vision. Until after I'm dead and right, raised, right? So what happened there? They got a partial vision of what he would be in his, his glorified person, right? Is what they got. And yet when it was over, what did he say to the fellows? Don't tell anybody okay, until. And what's that show you? His humility, all right? His humility. He was preparing those three for something special is what we find. All right. So I'm turning the page uh, to H. Did, did Joy come with me here? Okay. She did. Okay. Good. So what I believe perhaps is a, the severest strain of all his life was the repression of himself. The repression of himself. Now, I'm going to give you a little testimony here. This is from my past life. And I wasn't even a believer. But, 
But when I was on a ship in New York, I was, I was recommended for officer candidate school. So I get all dressed up and I had to go to the headquarters. And I sat before, I think it was four or five officers, but one of them was the uh, 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 commander. He's a, a full admiral, five-star guy, you know, of, of the Coast Guard 3rd District is what it was, you know. And during the course of that interview and the way things went, you would have thought he was just a common seaman. He was so personable. And, and if he was just sitting there with, with a sports coat on or something, you would have never known that he controlled thousands and thousands of men, about 50 ships and everything else that goes with that, you know, in, in the military. He was just a common man. All right. A common man. And I think what we need to see is this. Our Lord Jesus Christ was the very son of God. Was he not? He was the word of God made flesh. What was in him? God was in him reconciling the world to himself. But what did he do with that? Except for the transfiguration. What do we see? He kept who he was inside of him. All right. Inside of him. Perhaps the severest strain of all his life was repression of who he was. Uh, come, come to John. Let's look at these verses. We, we know all these verses, but let's read them anyway. All right. John chapter number one. First four verses say this. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. All by him. In him was life. And the life was the what? Light of men. So it takes you right back to Genesis chapter number one. But come to Philippians chapter two with me. I mean, this is who he was. Can you imagine Jesus walking down the street in his sandals, you know, and hearing the crunch of the dirt underneath him? No, I made that. <laughs> I created that, you know, just the simple thing of the dust and the dirt. But he kept all that within him. You know, we come to Philippians chapter number two. Uh, notice, please, verses five through eight. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't have to grab onto it, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. He <laughs> being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Now you think about that. Who created the tree that the cross came from? Okay. He humbled himself. Then I come back to John chapter 5. I got you flipping all over the place here this morning. John chapter 5, please. And notice verse 30. Where it says this, I can do nothing on my own initiative as I hear, he says, I judge and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will. Do you notice that? My own will, but the will of him who sent me. Then I slide down to uh, or over to chapter 14, please. In verse number 10, 14, 10. All right, Dan, almost there. 1410, it says this. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Question mark. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding where? In me does his works. What did we talk about last Wednesday night for those of you who were with us? Anybody remember? What do we talk about? He is in us. But are you in him? That's not an automatic. Him being in us is an automatic when you get saved. That's what we looked at 
All right, and what Wednesday night? But here he says, what? The Father abiding where? In me, okay, does the work. I mean, that's exciting when you read that kind of stuff, all right? That's exciting. It's the Father. So his whole life was a life of self-renunciation. He didn't take credit, gave it to where he thought it belonged, and that was with his Father. So when we look at the cross then, come back to Matthew 27, all right? Matthew 27, notice with me, please, verses 39 to 44. 27, 39 to 44 says this, say this. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuses at him, wagging their heads. And saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God. Come down from the cross. Destroy the temple. What was the Jews' most precious possession? The temple. What is your most precious possession? Christ in you, right? And what does Paul say we are? The temple of God. Bought with a price. Thank you, ma'am. Yet what does Christianity want to do? Now, this is off subject. They want to rebuild the temple. When I read in the book of Revelation, but... The Lamb and God are the temple thereof. Christianity always wants to go back to this material stuff. And you and I are the temple of God. And Paul says in Romans chapter, uh, I mean, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, that we're being placed together as a habitation for God. It's great as you look at this stuff. But let me continue on. Okay. Uh, let's see. Verse 41, in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. You know, you ought to go back and read Isaiah 53 one more time for once, once a day for the next five years and see if you get a hold of what, what the Lord Jesus Christ went through in his life as he walked in his life, even in death, they harassed him. See? It's a sad situation that, that we see. But when we go to, I'm not going to turn there, but when we go to Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, what does the Lord say after being insulted and, you know, nails driven in his hands and whipped and scourged and bleeding, crowns of thorns? He says, Father, forgive them. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. Bad situation. But that was his attitude in his suffering of the cross. Now, one more thing. How about his attitude in the resurrection? Come back to Luke with me, please, in chapter 24. We've spent so much time in this passage. <clears throat> On the road to Emmaus. OK, uh, let's notice I'm not going to read the whole account here, verses 13 to 35, but just verses 25 to 27, 25 to 27. This is our Lord's attitude in the resurrection. Now, he's been raised from the dead, right? That sort of thing. I'm thinking of doing a, uh, a message next Sunday concerning what kind of body did the Lord come out of the grave with? And talk about that for a while, okay? Now, no, notice what it says here in 25. Because remember, he's walking with these fellas, these two gentlemen. Did they recognize him? No. When the apostles were out fishing, he was on the, on the beach cooking fish. Did they recognize him? No, John finally recognized him because of what he was doing. Now, watch what it says. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. 
Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, the wonderment to me, folks, is this. He could have appeared to them as he appeared to uh, Peter, James, and John in the transfiguration after the resurrection, but he didn't. He appeared as a man. And he explained to them everything that the uh, uh, prophet said had to happen to him. What's he trying to do? He's trying to solidify their belief in who he is. That's what we see in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a couple of verses, and I didn't, didn't read them, where it, it talks about uh, many believed. But it doesn't say believed in him or on him. Just believed. And a few verses later, the Lord has to uh, rebuke them. Okay, because they're the ones that wanted to stone him. I mean, it's 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 amazing the life our Lord Jesus Christ had and what we see in terms of the uh, things that he bore. Okay, so that he could end up where come back to Revelation with me, please. Chapter five again. Revelation chapter five. Revelation chapter 5. Notice again, verse number 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. What is a throne for? That's for a king. Have you and I, according to Colossians, been transferred into the kingdom of his dear son? Yes, we have. So he is a king now. So is, is the kingdom going on now? It certainly is. We're not waiting for him to come back to set up a kingdom. It's already began. He began it when he was here. And it's going on. He's been a king since then, see? And then we end up with what? Verse number six. And I saw heaven. I saw between the throne, the throne, <laughs> that our Lord sits on with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to where? All the earth. Okay. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. I'd like to read the, the rest of the, uh, the book of Revelation to you. It's so exciting to see what has happened. All right. To the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you would think that as deity, he, he could have come to this earth and been accepted for everything that he did. But you know what? No acceptance, only a few. What are the few called? I believe. Ends with an E, ends with a T. The elect, the elect. He's a savior of all men, but especially them that believe. What's that mean? It means that you and I get to live a life of heaven right here on earth until we're in his presence. 